Here was a pivotal point in my life. When Luke was a year and a half, my wife's parents, they loved Disney World. So they wanted mm -hmm. us all to go to Disney. And I'm like, I can't go to Disney because I work, I trade my time for money. So it's not the cost of me going to Disney. It's the cost of what I'm going to lose by going to Disney. So Christine and Luke, who was one and a half, went to Disney with her family. And I was sad that I missed mm -hmm. the first time with my kid in Disney. And one of my clients said to me, hey, John, you need to learn to make money in your sleep. And I was like, that's where the light bulb went off. Everybody to the Biz Dad podcast. Thank you so much for jumping in today. I am uh, thrilled to be chatting with John Edwin, um, father of three kiddos, married for a long time. So I'm looking forward to kind of uh, stealing some of his secrets uh, on how to have a lasting marriage, uh, raise three awesome kids. Um, I can't wait to, uh, to dig in a little deeper. Uh, but John, before I tell too much about you, go ahead and if you can introduce yourself, tell us about your family and tell us about your businesses. Yeah, Adam, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, when you launched this podcast, I remember you posted in, in the GoBundance uh, Facebook page that you were launching the Biz, the Biz Dad podcast. And I was instantly intrigued to, uh, to potentially hop on and also listen to your content. So thank you so much for creating this because I know you're adding a lot of value to not just fathers, but families. And that's what's so important in, in our lives. Um, Thank you. To give you a little background on myself, I grew up uh, in Philly, born and raised. Uh, not like Will Smith because he was in West <laughs> Philly. I was in I was in a, another uh, part of Philadelphia called uh, was a, it would be considered North Philly, which uh, is is similar though because uh, Philadelphia in the neighborhoods I grew up in in a neighborhood called Alany, uh, relatively rough uh, neighborhood, rough upbringing. Uh, my father is from Pakistan, so he came over in the late 60s when he was in his, I think he was 27, when he came over and married my mom. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we, uh, so, so we grew up in the inner city, but when you grow up in, in a kind of a rough environment, you, but everyone else is that way, you kind of, you, you don't know any different. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I like to, uh, as we talked about a little earlier, Adam, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the ways that I live as a father and a husband is different than the way I grew up. Um, so my, my dad was a very kind of hard man, um, very, um, Pa patriarch uh kind of system over in in the villages of pakistan mm -hmm. and you know the way the, what, what the father says goes uh which which you know we want to obviously live strong as husbands and fathers but we also want to be make sure that we're sensitive to uh our wives and and our kids and um <clears throat> yeah so Went on to Liberty University. I was a good athlete, thank God. So I got a uh, partial scholarship for track and field to Liberty. And uh, that was an amazing experience. Um, going back a little bit to high school, um, my parents, they, they separated uh, when I was in 10th grade. And the beautiful thing that happened was my mom moved me out of that neighborhood into the suburbs. And um, in 11th grade, I met my then girlfriend, now wife. And um, nice. I thought that I was not good enough for, you know, Christine, she's an amazing woman. She was cheerleading captain in 11th and 12th grade and kind uh, of out, out of my out of my reach, uh, or so I thought. But um, yeah, we continued to date since we were 16. We've never broken up. We're 45 now. Um, and we continue to date now. And uh, yes, then she went on to Penn State for two years. I went to Liberty. And uh, junior year, she actually transferred over to Liberty. We both ended up graduating from uh, Liberty University. And uh, my daughter, we're jumping around a little bit, but my daughter, who's now yeah. 18, just graduated high school. And she committed to Liberty. So she's going to yeah. take up nursing. Yeah. Yes. And potentially be a uh, nurse practitioner. But whatever direction she wants to go, we fully support. Um, so, so going back a little, we graduate from Liberty and, uh, actually our senior year, we got engaged. I kind of knew that, uh, at 20 years old, I knew that, uh, Christine and I were going to be together forever. And so did she. And so, uh, we got engaged our senior year. And then, uh, when we both turned 21 at right after we graduated, uh, we got married. Nice. And, uh, we're living on love because we, we, at that time didn't have any money. We actually had <laughs> a lot of debt. <laughs> yeah no kidding two college students yeah uh-huh absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so you know we uh we we just started working right right out of the gate and um and then and then uh christine got her master's at 24 uh in september we had our first child uh luke 
in October. So, um, so there, that was a, that was a quick turnaround. He came a little earlier than we had expected. So then we decided to, um, you know, have all three kids, uh, while we were young. So we, we had all three in our twenties and, um, and yeah, now, now, now we're 45, been married 23 years. Uh, Luke is 20, Sylvie is 18 and our youngest Caleb is 15. And, you know, God has been really merciful, uh, in our lives. That's awesome. Yeah. The, uh, I wish that I would have met my wife when we were in high school. Like it was one of those that, you know, we met when I was in the military much later on and it, you know, and then I, I got out of the military, we ended up getting married and didn't have kids for four years after getting married. And then God decided we were going to separate each, each, uh, pregnancy by four years. So I wish that we had all of our kids in our twenties, you know, but, uh, but it is what it is. It's, you know, we had them all in our thirties instead, but, um, absolute blessing i love uh i love having kids it's obviously you know something i'm passionate about hence we're chatting about this but i'm looking forward to digging in a lot there there's there's uh a lot there and, and again i know I, I said it to you already but uh, congrats on your daughter getting accepted to uh, liberty that's awesome uh you're you. sending me the pictures before the call i loved it um now uh um i want to go into a, a little bit more of your background one thing i did not know that uh, your dad was pakistani this was this was news to me so that's uh um uh there's there's something that i'm finding a lot so my wife is first generation american her mom was born and raised in cuba and her dad was born and raised in spain um ended up you know meeting each other in spain because they left cuba my my mother-in-law left cuba for, uh, to spain because they wouldn't let her go to america cuba was like no you're not going to america we'll send you to some other you know socialist country not to uh you know uh america so uh and then she ends up coming here from spain um but uh the the passion and drive I hear from immigrants and their children is so much different to me than, you know, like fifth generation Americans who just seem to think that everything should be on a platter for them. And I'm, I'm just, I'm intrigued by, uh, just personally analyzing some of these conversations. So, um, if you can, let's walk back to, you know, you mentioned your dad being more of like a authoritarian almost and, and like, Hey, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm the patriarch. I'm the, I'm the lead of this thing. Um, tell me what that was like kind of growing up for you until you, until you moved out. Like, what was it, you know, what was the image you had of your dad then? What is the image you have of your dad now? How do you juxtapose those two things? Yeah. Um, you know, m growing up, I mean, my dad was, was a, a big, strong guy. I mean, if you see most Pakistanis, they're, they're not normally, normally yeah. that big, uh, for whatever reason, my family's a relatively big gene. I'm a, I'm a pretty big guy. Uh, my dad was actually a little bit, he was bigger than me. Um, you know, so, so he had this kind of booming big personality, uh, which was amazing. Um, uh, and at the same time it, it was intimidating and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was always his way or the highway, um, which, you know, I tried to, as I got older, kind of, uh, infiltrate that mindset where it's like, Hey dad, you know, it, <laughs> It, it doesn't there it's not always black and white you know mm -hmm. there there is quite a quite a lot of gray and there's things that you need to consider ab about you know your personality that um you know could be a little bit softer a little bit smoother and uh you know you'll catch more catch more flies with honey than uh than vinegar mm -hmm. but um but yeah i mean that's that's the way he lived you you know he was he was very he, he was a hard man and um but there were there were great lessons that i learned through that um you know some of his good points was super generous guy um whatever you whatever you needed if he if he had it he had a big heart uh he he would give it to you but but then also um <clears throat> i think kind of that that ego was was pretty big too where um he wouldn't accept other people's opinions or compromise uh with my mom on things and mm -hmm. and uh so so that that created a lot of conflict especially when you're from two so foreign cultures um but you know for me i i always i, I worked very very hard i was a good athlete um i was always grinding and um you know, yeah, you learn not to take anything for granted when you grow up in a rougher uh, neighborhood because, um, you know, and no, not not just you, but like nobody really has all that much at that at that point. Um, so, kind of when I launched into college, I just I really I really went into uh, overdrive, uh, especially with my academics, where I was like, you know what, I have actually an opportunity right now to uh, to do something big. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I was studying exercise science. I plan on going on to get my doctorate in uh, physical therapy. <laughs> and then my senior year of college, I did a, an internship in PT 
and I actually didn't like it. Uh, it, it just wasn't for me. It was a little too slow. Um, so coming out of college, uh, I went into sales for a short period of time. Um, but then I, but then I went into personal training, which I never thought I could make any money doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started out at eight bucks an hour when I was 22 years old. Uh, but by the time I was 24, I launched my first LLC, which is called Strength Personal Training, which I actually ran for 20 years. And uh, by the time I was 25, I was you know, making well into the six figures running my own nice. business as a personal trainer and one of the top trainers you know, in the country. That's awesome. Yeah, that... Uh... <laughs> The the level of discipline that it takes to you know there's I forgot who I was l listening to recently but they were talking about how just just having your own fitness level shows just a level of of dedication that you are willing to put in that is immediately attractive even to uh, to a mate right like to to a wife um, it's like oh well this person at least is self disciplined enough to be able to do that you know so that gives a good sign on where they're going to go in life and uh, I'm not saying that physical fitness is what got you to be where you're at but in a way it kind of is right because you started your own company started making a lot of money doing it um, and just having that discipline and that drive um, that it sounds like you got a lot from from your dad um, even though you kind of uh, took a little bit more of the softer side elsewhere I would assume from your mom you mentioned there was two very different cultures um, is your mom uh, Amer was is she yeah. American? Yeah, her I'm family's guessing? been here for generations. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. The, it's funny. I uh, I saw her yesterday. We had lunch together. She's like, "Oh my gosh, you're so you look nothing like me." <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of funny, but um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So she um, but it was interesting too because she uh, her parents passed away uh when she was young. So I I really never met her parents. Okay. She didn't have siblings. So really, I just grew up with my Pakistani side. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had two older, I had two older sisters and, and then other siblings that came along when my dad remarried. Um, but yeah, so, so I didn't really know my mom's family. I don't know them very well. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, I kind of just, I found my own way, you know, um, through the books that I was reading. Um, one of the books that, you know, was talked about a lot and isn't talked about all that much now. Cause everybody talks about rich dad, poor dad, but, uh, how to win friends and, and influence mm -hmm. people was, was a big book, uh, that really influenced me when I was probably around 18, 19. I, I read that book and I've read it many times and, uh, it's just kind of like, you know, you have to be the bigger person and uh, everyone has their own opinion. And when you make people wrong, you usually create enemies and there is a time and place for that. But you also uh, want to, you, you also want to make sure that, you know, um, we're, we're like, for me, I'm trying to live out my light for the Lord. Right. And, mm -hmm. and by doing that, um, isn't telling others that they're, they're wrong. It's just by showing others by how I live. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely love that. And I definitely want to get into the Christianity side of the house, especially, um, let me preface this. Why, um, how old was your dad when he came to America? I think he was 27, 26, okay. or 27. And you said you had your, your, uh, the family on the Pakistani side. Did your dad's family come over here as well, or is it just him? Yeah. So he was one of the first that came over. Um, and, and talk about hard work from what I understand, he, uh, he, he worked in a bubblegum factory and put himself through temple business school. Um, okay. and then he also, uh, started bringing his siblings over, brought his parents over. Um, yeah, so pretty much all of my family is here. I have some, I have some, uh, you know, uh, distant cousins that are over there that mm -hmm. I know, but, uh, but pretty much everyone is here. Yeah. Okay. And what, what was it that led him to come and the rest of his family to follow suit? Yeah, I think it's it's the American dream. Uh, it's interesting uh, that we're on this topic because my dad, you know, you talk about multi multiple generations that are here that kind of have uh, maybe an attitude of entitlement, right? Mm -hmm. or some type of expectation. My dad was actually really big on um, buying all made in the USA. So like his cars, his clothes, he would check everything yeah. because, you know, uh, it was just, it's, and you talk, you, you talk to foreigners that, that come here now and it's still very similar where you know this is a, a land of such great opportunity and and there's just yeah. so much patriotism and pride to be here 
Yeah. And it's funny because like for the for all the people who are complaining and saying that this is a terrible country, like A, they've probably had generations of being here. Um, and B, what country are you planning to line up and go to? Right. Because I've been to a lot of countries. Um, a lot of countries. Some of them war torn, some of them not, right? But I there's still not another country that I'm ready to just say, you know what, I'm gonna go over there and hang out there and knock on their door. Uh, but we've got a ton of people wanting to knock on our door. Like that doesn't that doesn't it, it mean that in line we're perfect by any means. There's always room for us to grow and get better as a country um and improve but uh uh man oh man i'd love to see some of this other stuff happen in some of the other countries right um no it's true it's true and i've traveled my wife and i we've tr we've traveled to a lot of countries as well i've never i've never been to a country that is anything like the united states yeah. i mean yeah. from landscapes to different environments to uh just the beauty of it and the culture yeah, I completely agreed. I mean, I, I lived in Japan for three years. I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, the fun military places that uh, they get to send us, you know, uh, parts of the Sahara and Africa and various different spots. Um, uh, somewhere around, I don't know, 25 countries or so. And there's no way I would say I would like, I would love to travel the world months at a time. But I want to come back home, you know, like there's no, there is no place like hanging out back here and the, the freedoms and, and things that we get to enjoy here in America. Um, Absolutely. So you mentioned, uh, obviously, you know, uh, shining a light for the Lord and, and being a Christian, you know, we were chatting even before this, um, uh, there's a, you know, a, a, uh, uh, a micro tribe in GoBundance called the, the Christianity micro tribe and that you're, you're one of the, the co-hosts of that. Um, when did you kind of get your your grasp on Christianity? Uh, I mean, you went to Liberty University, which is known to be a very Christian school. Um, were you a Christian before that, or did it come after? Um, so, over in Pakistan, like uh, generations, and and uh, you know, Pakistan became a country in I want to say forty five, forty six. I can't remember the exact year. Uh, but before that, it was all it was all part of India, and so. For, mm -hmm. But for about I think three generations um, before me, uh, there was a missionary over there that uh, I guess had, um, you know, converted quite a few um, Muslims and also Hindus. Um, and so, you know, over there, um, arranged marriages is is the norm. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a in a Christian community, uh, usually you'll get arrangements. So, dating back from before my grand, I think to my great grandfather and great grandmother, uh, they converted uh, to Christianity, wow. and uh, and so that kind of bred through. Um, and that was also probably another big factor why my family came over because of religious persecution. Uh, my dad would tell me, you know, a lot of stories about, um, you know, uh, religious persecution, you yeah, know, where yeah. he, he it, there would, there would, there would inevitably be a lot of altercations, uh, growing up. If you're a Christian, you, you, mm -hmm. you get, you know, you get ridiculed, you get made fun of, you get beat up, um, you know, so, and then my mom, my, so my dad and mom actually met in a, in a church in Philly, uh, which was nice. a relatively, uh, famous church. Um, shoot. I don't remember the exact name of it now. Dr. Boise, uh, famous, okay. uh, preacher, uh, who passed away in 2000, I believe, uh, Dr. Boise, he was a really well-known, um, preacher, but, but anyway, so they met, they met there and, um, and yeah, so I accepted Christ at a, at a young age. Um, I think I saw one of those like rapture movies at church <laughs> kind of scared me into it. I, I want to uh -huh. say I was like four or five. It was like, you know, I don't know, Mark of the Beast or one of these, one of these movies that, uh, that, that would scare you. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't want to go to hell. Like, you know, but then, you know, also growing up, uh, and, and seeing some of the hypocrisy, uh, in my family and in the church kind of, I steered away from it. So I, I, wasn't going to church very frequently in my teenage years and uh, pretty rebellious, which is another great thing that my mom moved me out of the city because um, I was getting myself in a lot of trouble. Um, and yeah, and then I really didn't didn't open the Bible or have much of a faith uh, until right before I turned 18. Um, I was dating Christine and uh, one night we just got in talking about you know, our faith and, and she grew up, um, Catholic, but really was kind of more, uh, subjective relativism. If, you know, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense, um, and just didn't have any type of firm, firm foundation. And I just, it was, it was like inside of me, but it yeah. just hadn't been there for a while. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just kind of started talking to her about 
God and Romans Road and this and that. And she literally, the night before she um, went to Penn State our freshman year, she accepted Christ. Wow. And that nice. was like, that was pretty much the turning port point in our relationship and also uh, for me spiritually. Well, that's that's uh, awesome. Yeah, I, I was very curious. I mean, as a, um, again, as a, I have uh, a very different view on you know Afghanistan Pakistan given my my history right i mean i was well, when i was deployed i was deployed to a spot called asadabad right next to the pakistani border um and we used to get attacked from from pakistan all the time right and of course a lot of that is is uh very you know the the start of a lot of that religiously motivated in in one way shape or form so uh to hear that uh your family came over as christians to me was like it's it's exciting for me to hear but it was also never something that i saw right like even in iraq was a different story we had a lot of people that would come up to us very thankful like oh we're christians we're christians and they were like super excited to celebrate that you know i was, I was in baghdad so a very large city um but in afghanistan completely different world i never got to experience that at all i never had anybody coming up to me excited to share the fact that they were christians so um you know to me I, I, it's that's thrilling for me and I'm, I'm i'm happy to hear that 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 is the case that that uh, the seed was planted years ago and you were able to kind of um you know pull that out from your from your family you did mention though like uh hypocrisy and family and church can you talk to me about what that looked like for you and what what you saw that hypocrisy as um yeah i i mean there were there were uh you know people who were higher in church and they're running around on their on their wives mm -hmm. uh, my dad was also unfaithful i don't know how many times i think many many times on on my mom um, and there was, there was domestic violence in my house. So, mm -hmm. um, so that kind of, when you, you know, when you, you know, whether it be a father or a mother, they tell you to live one way and they're living another yeah, way. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's going to, you know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to believe their words. You're going to believe their actions. Yeah. Sorry. My, my dog is very vocal. I have no two big deal. My one, dog will one be the same super thing quiet. And the other one is like, she's like, She's always barking. So. No problem at all. You can only um, imagine how hard it is to podcast in my house. Which is why I drive to <laughs> I drive to Renault like an hour and forty five minutes away to yeah. sit in Josh's office and we podcast. Oh, there you go. The time. Yeah, that makes sense. Hence, you only yeah. record once, uh, you know, like once in a while. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, I've got three kids and a dog running around the house, so I completely get it. Um, I completely get it. I mean, right before we started, you saw one of them come in hiding from a Nerf gun battle, right? So uh, that's a constant <laughs> state of affairs. The amount of times I've had things thrown at me and the dog come jumping in in the middle of the podcast uh, is, is, yeah, um, innumerable. Well, this is a fun podcast where, you know, yeah. uh, these things can happen, right? It's it's yep. not like so corporate and, and serious, you know? It's like exactly. these are kind of the fun things that happen on the Biz Dad, you know, podcast. Exactly. That's part of being a biz dad is like, I, I have no problem working from home and having my kids run around and shoot me in the head with a Nerf dart. Uh, once in a while, we've got to tone it down a little bit. There've been a couple of them get out of hand, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I, I have, I'm totally understanding of where you're at on, on seeing the hypocrisy in, in, in church and whatnot. And it's been something that, you know, it, it's, I, I was recently in a, uh, I had a, a post that a few people had given me a hard time about, about Jordan Peterson and, um, like I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson and listening to a lot of his stuff. But, you know, one thing I posted was, um, how we can't get our, uh, view and beliefs of Christianity based off of things that he's saying, because a lot of people are starting to do that. And it's like, no, like he's not, um, a, he's not even a Christian yet, right? And B, like, let's let's figure out, you know, what what the Bible is actually saying, you know, because every human is going to fail us. That's just by our nature, we're going to fail, you know, our kids, we're going to fail our spouses, we're going to fail. That doesn't mean that we're not striving to not fail, but we're going to, right? And uh, there was a time, um, uh, do you know who uh, Mark Driscoll is? The name sounds familiar, but so he's not. a he's a pastor. He was a pastor of a church called Mars Hill Church out in Washington, um, and it was like one of the fastest growing churches in the country. And he was like he he preaches really well to men, um, but he had a a a, a big fall um, in a couple different ways uh, that that was very public in and uh, like it really it shook me a lot, like because I was following a lot of the stuff he did, and I bounced around a lot being in the military, and um, so I like I had churches that I would. I would go to, but I listened to quite a few pastors online and he was one of the guys I really liked to listen to. And it was like one of those that, that shook me really bad. And I was like, what in the world? Like, what is going on? And then you have somebody like, oh, I'm going to forget his name right now. Um, 
but it didn't come out until this guy passed that he was like sexually molesting a lot of women and all sorts of like he was borderline mm. uh you know it was it was rough and i'm like it, it took me a while to really go through and say, you know what? There are humans that are going to fail every one of us. Um, that's just bound to happen. It doesn't matter whether their title is pastor. It doesn't matter whether their title is dad. It doesn't matter whether their title is whatever. They're still humans and they're still going to fail. Um, and that's where it's like, it's encouraging to know that um, uh, if we put our faith in the right place, which is Jesus and put our faith in the right, you know, you know the right word, which is the Bible, then it doesn't matter whether those humans fail us because we have the strength and backing of a good found, firm foundation. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I, th- I feel like um, you, you're absolutely right. I, by the way, I did see your post on Jordan Peterson. I don't, I don't know, you know, his heart, maybe he is, yeah. maybe he's not a Christian, but um, you know, if you're if you're listening and you've grown up in the church and you're you've seen the hypocrisy and there's a reason you you know because you do hear that a lot of times where people are like oh yeah you know i gave church a try but i saw this and that and whatever um but just understand like that's that's an immature view of Mm -hmm. who god is and um you know i just had to come to a place where my faith did not rely upon my my parents or the church I grew up in. You yes. know, it had to be a personal faith uh, with Christ, and and that's really that's the that's the place of maturity that I that I came to. That's like okay, I got to stop holding other people, you know, to a certain standard and and hold yeah. myself accountable of of where you know where my belief and my faith is. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, and I completely agree. How have you been communicating that type of thing to your to your kids, right? You have three kids, 15 mm-hmm. and older. Like, how has that conversation gone with your kids? How have you kind of, um, you know, there's a, I forgot what the statistic is, but it's something like if a child comes to uh, um, be a Christian, there's like a 3% chance that the family will follow suit. Um, if the wife does, it's like a 40% chance or a 30% chance. But if the, if the dad does, it's like a 93% chance that the kids will follow, right? So your family has one leg up in knowing that you as, uh, as the, you know, the leader of the household, the dad in the house is a Christian. Um, how are you actually communicating that, that type of, um, uh, faith to your kids to let them choose their own path, right? Because in, in the long run, we have to have our kids choose their own path. We can't choose it for them. So, you know, what kind of conversations do you have to encourage it? What sort of uh, activities do you guys do to help kind of keep that on, on the front of mind? Yeah. I mean, you know, it reminds me of the verse and I, I can't tell you the exact uh, reference, but, you know, you bring a child up in the way he should go. And, mm-hmm. you know, when when he's older, he will not he will not forget it. Right. So yep. when people say like, oh, I'm not bringing my kids up in any type of faith or religion, I think that they're they're really um, they're they're really um, that's a disservice to your kid. Right. Yeah. So ultimately, yes, my kids will decide on whatever direction they're going to go in life. Um, but you know, we, we've always been, been really intentional about, um, you know, church on Sundays, you know, it was interesting going through COVID because that really hurt a lot of families and a Mm -hmm. lot of families still haven't even recovered from, um, you know, staying out of the church, but, uh, but we've, we've been really big on, um, you know, not just, not just going on Sunday, but our kids going to youth group, um, getting involved in service projects have been really big. Our church is super, super service and community oriented. So like, mm-hmm. we'll, you know, pick a, every couple months, we'll pick a place where, you know, whether it be, uh, the homeless shelter or, um, some, you know, wherever we go, we clean up a school. Um, there's a lot of different service projects. And so I'm grateful uh, at that, that, um, that our church has been in- involved in. And so we always try and get our, our kids involved in, in any type of service project. Um, even if it's around church, even if it's like just building a, a vegetable garden or whatever it is, um, we're always pushing our kids, you know, uh, going to vacation Bible school is big, um, mm-hmm. when you're older to, um, to not just go, but then, then to be one of the, one of the volunteers at yeah. vacation Bible school. Um, our kids have all grown up going to a Christian camp, like a sleepaway camp for a week. Um, and that's been instrumental. And, and then, um, this like last summer, two, two out of my three kids were counselors there. Um, you know, praying with the kids every, every morning, every night we pray with our kids, even as they were older, um, going, you know, going to high school, you know, we would stop every Mm -hmm. morning and pray with the kids. Um, and then around the dinner table, something that, uh, Christina and I have put into place since all of our kids have been super, super small is, is just conversation. Um, mm-hmm. and that, that's one of the things that I wrote, uh, cause you guys had asked 
what's what's your favorite thing to do as a family and and for me it's the five of us around around the around the table having dinner and um going through you know the the the, the highs and lows of your days we mm-hmm. call them yays and nays because that's how kids can relate but what's the yays and nays on your day so um you know then the kids get to openly talk about you know what was the what was the highlight of their day and also what kind of sucked about their day yeah um yeah. And then we can get in deeper discussions about that either at that time or later. So it's it's a really great kind of open forum where you can connect with your kids and you know because there's a lot of the day that you're not with them and you're not, you don't know who they're interacting with or, mm-hmm. or what's going on and that's just a connection point that that kind of gives you an opportunity to to step in and, and be a great example as a parent. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's uh, we do the highs and lows as well. Like my five year old on on Father's Day, we're all we're over at my parents' house, and he looked at me and says, "Dad, Dad," and I was like, "What are you I doing?" Love it. He's like. And I was like, what? what? He's like, your highs and lows, dad, your highs and lows. And I was like, I'm Maybe. sorry, I completely missed it. And for those just listening, my, my son was looking up in the air and then putting his head back down. It was rather comical to watch him try to uh, just motion to me to do highs and lows. But I, I love that they've picked up on it because we just recently started doing that. And it seems to be something that's enjoyable for them. And it, it, it adds for some extra conversation and just at the dinner table that's that you know maybe before was filled with you know TV on in the background or something silly. But now it's like, no, I can get to connect with the kids on a different level. Yeah, I mean, it's really eff- effective. And also, there's like other games to play. Um, for about a year, we did something. Hold, hold on, hold on. Look, it's within yeah. my reach. Hold on, I want to show you something. <laughs> All right. So I was, I was telling some of uh, some of the guys on one of my pods uh, earlier this week about this game that we used to play. So every Sunday, we would we would have uh, what's called the Snoopy Award. And uh, mm. here here's Snoopy. There he is. I like it. It says the sky's the limit. He's an astronaut. And uh, so every Sunday, somebody, whoever had it the week before, would would bring it down at dinner and present it to someone else in the family, whether it be one of the other kids or me or Christine. uh, But Mm -hmm. someone would get the Snoopy Award every week. And that person uh, who had it would recognize someone else in the family for something like some act of kindness that they did that week. And so it might be, you know, hey, Adam, I'm going to give you the Snoopy Award. You get it this week for whatever. whatever, whatever, whatever. But it had to be specific. It can't just be, yep. oh, you were great. No, it had to be a specific event that that person recognized the other person for. And then that person would get the Snoopy Award. They could say a little acceptance speech. And then they would have the Snoopy Award that week. And then the next Sunday, it would move to someone else. So there's something for your awesome. listeners. Do a Snoopy Award or whatever type of award. Yeah, I uh, I am going to do what I can to absolutely steal that and bring that back to uh, to my dinner table. I think that'll be a lot of fun to watch yeah. the kids do that. Especially, I mean, I mean, my youngest is only one, so she's not going to be that much uh, in the participation category at the moment. But man, oh man, it's going to be fun to watch the boys kind of do this and and celebrate each other. Um, the uh, I want to dig into a little bit about. Uh, we didn't go over any of your businesses yet, so I kind of want to learn a little bit about your businesses as well, um, and then I'll start digging into that some more. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I come from a from a health and fitness background. Um, la- you know, started as a trainer at uh, 22 years old. Like I said, mm-hmm. I was making eight bucks an hour. Here's something that I found early on um, is that, like we talked about uh, w- work ethic, right? So my shift was 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. I would open the gym around 5.30. Um, I picked a facility that was a wealthier a uh, very wealthy part of Philadelphia. So I was strategic in where I was going to uh, be work as a trainer. And so when I was just on the floor, I was making eight bucks an hour. Then when I was training, I think I was making maybe 18. Um, but I wanted to make sure that when people thought of a personal trainer, that they were, they were thinking of me. Right. Yeah. So, um, so my wife and I, we would drive into the city. We lived outside the city at the time. This was about a 40 minute drive. We'd be up around 345 every single morning and we would drive into the city and she was working, uh, in advertising as a, as a media buyer at the time. Um, the internet was, was new. Everything was, a uh, was a dot com mm-hmm. at the time. And so she was, she was a media buyer for an internet ag- uh, agency in Philly at the time. And, uh, so she would drop, she would come to the gym, work out at five 30, but then she was working like, uh, nine to five 30 or nine to six. So I'd be done my shift at two, 
but I would just continue to work as if I was working. And I was offering all these members uh, just, you know, a free session. So all of a sudden, mm-hmm. almost overnight, I was like, I was super busy. I was on the floor all the time. And as I was offering these free sessions, I was picking them up as clients. So within mm-hmm. that within the that first year, I was one of the top trainers on the East Coast. Second year, I was blowing it out of the water. And that's when I knew I was like, oh, I got to I have to go negotiate my own facility and launch my mm-hmm. own business because I'm giving away so much money out. You know, I was bringing in between 14 to 16,000 a month and I was giving it half, half back at that time. Wow. So, um, yeah. So then I negotiated my own facility, boom, launched that. All my clients followed suit with me. I was running a personal training business. Um, and then, and then we also were having, we started having babies at the same time. Um, and here's a, here was a pivotal point in my life. <clears throat> when Luke was a year and a half, uh, my wife's parents, they love Disney World. So they wanted mm-hmm. us all to go to Disney. And I'm like, I, I can't go to Disney because, you know, I work, I work, you know, I trade my time for money. So it's like, it's not the cost of me going to Disney. It's the cost of what I'm going to lose by going to Disney. So Christine and Luke, who was one and a half, went to Disney with uh, with her family and I was kind of sad that I missed, you know, mm-hmm. the first time my, with my kid in Disney. And one of my clients said to me, hey, John, you need to learn to make money in your sleep. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that, that's where the light bulb went off. I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, she's like, if I don't want to work, if I, if I feel sick, if I'm tired, whatever. She's like, I still have money coming in. I was like, okay, explain this whole thing to me. You know, I'm, I'm tw- 24 years old. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I didn't have anybody that I knew that owned any real estate or did rentals or did anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, she started explaining to me about real estate. So then I'm like, all right, I'm good. I'm just going to do this. So I literally, she wasn't a mentor at all. She just kind of planted that in my brain. And mm-hmm. I, uh, I bought my first piece of real estate. I did everything wrong. I took a line of credit all on, on my house. So I was burring before burr was a word. Uh, so I bought it all cash, renovated it, you know, rented it. Once it was seasoned, I refied it. Uh, now mm-hmm. everybody knows burring. I, I didn't yep. even know burr was a burr. I just was like, this is the only way I can actually do it. So when I got my money back, I bought another one, you know, after a year of doing everything wrong and then bought another one. And then I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I started flipping. So I was still running my personal training business and then moonlighting and flipping uh, with, with uh, con- you know, construction crews and stuff like that. And then what was interesting was I you know, I joined Go Abundance. I was like 38 when I joined and I had some passive income and I also had progressed by this point. I'm not going to give you guys all the details, but now I own like a, a large MMA facility. I had some of the best boxers in the world. I had guys fighting in the UFC. I had a staff of, you know, all wow. kinds of trainers. We were running 130 classes a month. Like I was in charge of all that and buying real estate. And then I joined Go Abundance at 38. And I remember I, um, I probably owned Maybe I held like 13 different rentals at the time. I probably flipped 40 some. So I was just flipping for seed money and, and then buying other things and, you know, doing whatever. And um, I sat and I was doing a one sheet with a guy. Um, who was it? It was Matt uh, Lenza, Matt Lenza. And I looked at his one sheet and it said under uh, horizontal income, it was like a little over $2,000, $200,000. And I'm like, you know, at that point I was making like, maybe 60,000 in horizontal, horizontal. I didn't know mm-hmm. what horizontal income was. That's a thing that abundance said is for passive income. And I was like, how'd you do that? And he's like, oh, well, uh, for real estate, I was like, oh, I got to stop selling properties. <laughs> I, I yeah. got to start holding, yeah. I got to start holding properties. So, you know, it took me, it took me about five years. So now, you know, now we're, you know, I don't know, our, our passive is well over 300, 400, 500,000, uh, from nice. just holding properties. But, uh, but you know, that's, that is the power of real estate. And then once, once, uh, COVID hit and my gym shut down, uh, my wife and I just kept buying real estate. And now we're also into land development, uh, where I'm a managing partner of some very, very large parcels of land. And so we take them through the entitlement process and sell to end users. And, uh, I'm working with Josh McCallum on his executive team, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're doing a lot of really cool, really fun stuff. Um, but you know, COVID at the time I thought was the worst thing that would happen because I was, I was so focused on grinding that like, yeah, if COVID didn't happen, I'd still be a trainer and I wouldn't be doing all these other really cool things. Mm-hmm. 
that we're doing now, right? So uh, just because I wouldn't have given myself that time to to just sit back and figure out like, oh, this is, you know, this is really cool. Oh, this is really, this is yeah. something I can get into. So, um, you know, it, it, it was tough at, in the moment, but it was such a blessing in the long run. And that's, I, I think that it's, it says a lot that you heard something, right, from this client. Uh, and decided, wow, I need to change something, right? Because it took me a long time. Like I, I tell people all the time, I was like the the, and it's one of the reasons I ask about people's background and like where you, where do you come from? Because um, one of the books I really recommend to a lot of people is Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, like just to try to think through how you think about money and why you think about it that way, and it can be applied in a various numbers of ways throughout your life on like why do you th- like why you think about politics the way you do why you think about any number of things the way you do um just you know instead of thinking about it and for money look at it from any perspective but um so we've all kind of built this wireframe in our brain and until somebody comes through and like tears the wireframe apart and you rebuild it you don't know that you're looking at it through a specific wireframe so you hear from this client like you need to make money while you're sleeping and you're like I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Like it, you, that's the process of breaking down that wireframe. You know, obviously somebody stepped in to kind of help you build a wireframe to begin with. But like, did you all already have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, like a, a bit of a I want to build something spirit? Because um, uh, you you went into gym and uh, to you know working for somebody in a gym to then creating your own thing. Like how how did you? How did you get to the creation of your own thing? Did you already know at some point that was going to be the path or was, was there something else that came in and interrupted that? Yeah. Um, I, I had already, I had already had that in my mind. I just knew I had to build the following. Uh, so one, once I, once I had a following of people, I, I already, I already yeah. had in my mind a vision of, of where I was going to go. Um, and I, I actually had planned on opening a facility and then opening another facility and opening up another facility and creating mm-hmm. like a large, uh, gym network. Um, but it was interesting when I was running my the MMA facility, uh, Strength Academy. Um, it just became really apparent to me, and it could have just been the quote unquote fight game. And although that, like, our gym was amazing, like people still years later come up to me, like, "Oh man, that was the most magical, coolest place I've ever been a part of." Because we created an amazing culture, uh, and we were it was very community oriented. Um, but at the same time, I'm like. When I was going through it, I'm like, there's got to be a better way. Like I can, I can build wealth much faster and scale quicker than, than this, because there was like, like literally when, when you own play, you're in charge of it all. Right. So even though I have 16 other, you know, boxing and strength conditioning coaches, it's like, dude, if somebody shows up late for a class and there's 30 people waiting, I'm getting text messages and phone calls. And I remember one time I was at the Phillies game and I'm getting phone calls and text. I was like, I think that's it. Like, I can't, I can't keep scaling. Mm-hmm. And, and I was making good money. You know, I was making about a quarter million a year net myself. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm just like, ah, you know, I think, I think real estate is a better bet. And then we kept scaling and now we're doing a lot of other things in the real estate space, not just buying properties. But, um, but yeah, it's been a blessing, man. Yeah. I've, uh, I've always kind of had that, that mindset of, you know, having a, a larger vision of, uh, of, of just than where I was at the time. Where do you think you picked that up from? When do you think you, that came to fruition in you? Like, uh, do you remember that, like, back when you were in like elementary and junior high and high school, or is that something you picked up later on? I think it was more through, um, you know, when I got into selling Cutco when I was uh, eighteen, um, and and I really enjoyed, uh, you know, working with people and sales, and then and then when I ran a branch office for the company, and I started getting into like. Um, like self-help books, you know, I started mm-hmm. and, and at that time, you know, there was a bunch of tapes, you know, I was listening to Zig Ziglar all the time. I was listening to Brian Tracy, you know, I was li- old school. I was listening to Earl Nightingale. Um, and I was just constant on repeat, you know, and I just, I just let my car kind of be a rolling university at all times, you know, and now we can get on our cell phones and do the audibles but back then. I just, I just had tape after tape, repeat, 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 repeat. Mm-hmm. You know, and how to win friends and influence people. That was one of the tapes here. I must have listened to that 20 different times. And I was just constantly, my mind was constantly going and going and going. And I just knew, I I knew, you know, um, when the time was right, I would be ready. I, I'm always intrigued because I can never, I have yet to pin down. Maybe I need to go back and listen to a bunch of these. Um, 
a bunch of the own, my own conversations, but I've yet to really pin down. Sometimes you have like, Hey, my dad was an entrepreneur and it just kind of how it, how it happened. Um, but, uh, like really trying to narrow in what it is in somebody's psyche and where it actually comes from to, uh, to get them on that entrepreneurial path of like, no, I can do bigger. I can do better. I can grow. I can build, um, you know, where it kind of comes from. Cause like, I never saw any of it. I just happened to, um, uh, marry a woman who said I should look at real estate. Uh, and I was like, I didn't even know what a savings account was, let alone how to buy real estate. Like it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and that's where like, that was the, the restructuring of my, or the beginning of the, the destruction of my wireframe so I could rebuild it. Um, but how somebody comes, like I would have, I would love to have, you know, when I was 18 years old and joined the military had Zig Ziglar or how to win friends and influence people on, on my tape deck. Right. Like that would have been wonderful. Um, but like where, where I, I didn't even know who I would have come in contact to, to have, uh, put that in my brain. So where, where did you, where would you say was the, the first seed that said I, I should have these tapes in my car? I, I think it was for, actually from um, my buddy Earl Kelly. We're you know we're still many years, twenty seven years later, very good friends. Um, he was my district manager uh, who hired me for Cutco, and he's actually still with Vector Cutco now uh, as a really you know high up executive. Um, he went to Wharton uh, School of Business, and um, he he had these these books and these tapes, and you know I I was an eighteen year old kid, and I was just like, huh. Well, if he's listening to that kind of stuff, and 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 also, you know, um, uh, what's his name? The big guy, really big behemoth dude. Uh, what's his name? That the motivational guy, T- oh, Tony uh, Robbins. Tony Robbins. He, yep. Yeah, he would have Tony Robbins, and you know, the 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 giant within, or he, he had all these different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, man, you know, if if this guy's, if that's what he's listening to, if that's what he's reading, then I should just be doing it. Yeah. And that kind of that I just I just kind of mirrored it, um, what 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 he was up to, and you know, and then when I got out of college and they offered uh you know a full time position, uh with Cutco, I I just it wasn't for me anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, not saying it's it's I mean it's an amazing thing, great career path, but it just it just wasn't for me. I wanted you know I always had this big picture and big vision, and uh, I still think I'm not scratching the surface yet. Yeah. I think that it's it's always somebody in our histories that we can kind of go back to and figure out where it is that and what happened and that's why I mean, I I'm hoping that we can I'm hoping that I'm that person in somebody's history I don't know if I am or not but I would love to be that person in somebody's history where they reset kind of what their what their image was on where they could go and what they could do and um you know to be to be that impactful in somebody's life to to change the way they're even viewing about things like my wife is for me in my life like this like what an amazing thing to be able to to look back on and be excited about. So um. yeah, you know, and and in talking about being fathers and and talking about families, mm-hmm. I, th- I I I'm a firm believer get get your kids involved in something always uh, because that competitive nature is, is what will propel you to success. Now, whether it be competition in sport or just competition against yourself in academia or um, you know. What, whatever it is, musicals, what, whatever that is, have your kids constantly out um, involved in some some type of social setting. Uh, for for us, it it did start out as sports, but um, but it, it did, doesn't have to be that way. It can can be anything, um, but but always spark that competitive nature because you know when it's like it's like anything else. It's the small wins that that move move the sails in the ship. Uh, so mm-hmm. when the, when kids are, are starting out and they're, they're trying something new, uh, even if it's, if it's music, if it's a musical instrument, it's like, well, you know, you start out and you can't, you can't just play the piano. You, you got to learn, you know, a note. And then from that, you got to learn a chord. And then from that, you got to learn how to, you know, read music. And so yeah. it could be a guitar. It could be, could be, you know, wrestling. It doesn't matter. Um, it could be boxing, but the point is, it's like getting, getting something where, you're starting to see yourself get better, right? Mm-hmm. That builds the confidence. And, you know, um, talking about uh, entrepreneurship, it, it, you're not just going to instantly become self-made overnight unless yeah. it's maybe Bitcoin or one of these other things um, that I guess could make you that way. But but honestly, if you become successful overnight, kind of by mistake, you'll probably lose it. Yeah. You know, you're yeah, not. It's you're just not like well a majority of uh, lottery winners. Yeah, they don't. Exactly. They haven't, they haven't gotten you, themselves to that point. That's why they go. Boom yeah, you, so quick. You got to have the tools to keep you there and continue to progress. Yeah. Yeah, completely agreed. And you know, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the kids because that was going to be the next place I brought it. Was kind of like how do we how do we you know 
are my goal the same thing i like what i tell my boys all the time is that my goal is to raise them to be better men than me right so if i can raise them to be better men than me then i have to represent what a good man looks like and then show them and, and admit to my downfalls of where it's at and how to improve them so that they can improve on them early as well um so you know and i also am I'm a strong believer in the and and it's one of the reasons that you and i are in abundance is you know you surround yourself by like-minded people who are trying to grow and get better as well so if i can curate um, the kids that my kids are around, or even the adults that my kids are around that are going to be influencing them in a way that is uh, positive in nature, that is, uh, you know, I, I want good Christian men surrounding my my boys, right? Um, obviously, I have good Christian women as well. I'm not, I'm not, you know, biased in that sense. But in by having them surrounded by good Christian men who are striving to be great husbands, great leaders, great dads, um, and also encouraging other kids like mine to be great husbands, leaders, and dads later on in life, I think is going to be instrumental in their success. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of thoughts do you have on the curation of um, you know who your kids are surrounded by? Not only by you, but like like the environment that you put them in. Uh, have you done anything specific or not specific to kind of uh, build the environment around them to encourage what you're actually wanting to produce? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, like we talked about church and youth group, and yep, and uh, we talked about different camps and stuff, but also uh, you know having them. I was lucky enough to have uh, go abundance in in their lives, you know, at an early age. Seven years ago, we started doing different fan bonnet stuff. And if you guys don't know what fan bonnet is, it's it's uh, it's a great place for kids to not just learn how to live in community, but also to uh, learn, you know, financial literacy. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot, you know, fan bonnet teaches goal setting. It teaches a lot of different things that um, that you know normal normal school does not. Right. So um, my kids were involved, heavily involved in uh, in fan abundance for years uh, when they were younger. And it, and it was interesting because literally seven years ago, um, we were at the McCarthy's and I forget who encouraged it. But uh, but somebody did encourage the kids to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So all three of my kids read that at an early age, like what Caleb's 15 nice. now. So he was he was eight when he read it. And Sylvie was 11 and Luke was 13 and then you know mm -hmm. it was interesting to get their perspective after reading that book i sat them down and i had them teach me what assets and liabilities are and you know all these really cool things that that young people have no idea and, and actually most adults don't even understand yeah. what a liability <laughs> and an asset is uh but but you know i had them summarize the book and and we've been heavily involved in in uh in in fan abundance and and actually even Luke now 20, he's still, he's a part of a GoPod. He was on a GoPod last night. So, uh, talk about curating, you know, your kids and setting them up for success. For sure. Um, you know, we're really big into that. And, uh, I forget the name of it. It used to be go dudes. They just changed it because there are females involved, but, um, mm -hmm. but these young people, man, it's, it's awesome. And Luke's been on, uh, already to, um, to, uh, go cruise, uh, with go yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was just down in Austin at the AES and he was also in Vermont with me and they asked him to be a part of, I think the one in the fall, but he's playing soccer. Uh, but then, nice. but then Sylvie and Caleb will fo follow suit as well. Um, so like you're saying, like to have our kids around, you know, other successful, uh, men, women, and families is, Mm -hmm. It's just so amazing. And then, and then also uh, sports teaches you so much about winning and losing. Yeah. Something I've struggled on in the, the, the sports side is uh, um, I, I need to, A, I need to do a good job of, of preparing myself mentally for working through. Because my son, my oldest, loves golf. Like that's his thing. But he's also a perfectionist. And if you're a perfectionist, playing golf is probably a, uh, like, I mean, that's a, that's a tormenting type of game when you're a perfectionist. I mean, just about anything is. But golf seems to be like a, the, the top tier of dreadfulness um, when you're a perfectionist. So like I need to do a better job of showing up for him. Um, when we're on the golf course and I'm being his caddy and his dad at the same time, um, to, uh, to allow him to make those mistakes to, you know, uh, allow him to be upset about a shot, you know, cause I, like, I keep t like trying to balance this being a dad versus being a caddy, but like what, what, what role, what hat am I wearing at the moment, um, to ensure that I'm, I'm representing myself or representing my best self to him at, at the times that he needs it. Um, uh, but also, you know, when I, when I get, when he plays on a couple team ones and it's like, okay, well, 
I don't know the coach enough. I don't know like the influence that the other kids are having. And I, it's such a struggle for me to say, okay, I want to encourage the right people around him, but also the world is the world and the, he's going to be exposed to all sorts of different things. And um, so uh, saying all that to selfishly ask a question of what kind of conversations do you have after those sports matches or after they've been exposed to things that you know are not um, uh, in line with what you want them to 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 be what you what you want to represent uh how do you have conversations about what they're seeing versus uh what uh what the expectations are of them so let me just understand the question uh, mm -hmm. properly so i can give you uh, as as best of an answer as possible are you asking um you know when the kids when kids are on the sports field um, and you hear certain conversations or coaches uh, may say certain things. Are you asking uh, how I ha how I would handle that? Uh, so how do you handle the conversations after, right? Like, hey, you know, you you know that there were certain things that were said by the coach or certain things that were said by other players that are not yeah. acceptable in our family um, yeah. or that are more detrimental or discouraging rather than encouraging and building. Like, yeah. you know, how do you kind of have the conversations with your kids to to make sure that they're looking at this positively? Yeah. So I'll rewind just a little bit about you talking about uh, golf because I recently took this up a couple years ago and it is, it, it can be a very frustrating uh, sport uh, because, you know, it depends on the conditions and the this and so, mm -hmm. so many different factors are involved. Um, what I've always told my kids in sports and, and I've had the, um, just the honor to, uh, I, I would always jump in uh, and, and coach. I would always like volunteer. I would usually do assistant coaching because then I'd have to deal with the parents and I could have fun mm -hmm. with kids. But I did probably like 16 to 18 seasons of youth sports that I was coaching um, and, and some at high levels. So there, there was a lot of interactions that we had. Um, one of the things I would always tell, you know, uh, young people is that uh, great great athletes have short memories. So we're going to make mistakes. Like every sport is a game of mistakes, whether it be golf, whether it be baseball, whether it be soccer, whether it be wrestling, it doesn't matter what it is. Every sport is a game of mistakes. And the less mistakes you can make, the better, and you'll probably win. The team that makes the least amount of errors in baseball usually wins, especially at a lower age. Maybe in the pros, mm -hmm. they're not making too many errors, but but in Little League and, and before Little League, there's there's constant errors. And I would always say, by the way, everybody's going to make an error. So the quicker you can take a just, just take a deep breath, inhale, exhale, let it go. The quicker you can let that mistake go, you'll be ready for the next play. But when you ponder on that mistake, that's when you're going to tighten up. It's kind of like, you know, uh, I was in combat sports for a long time and still am. And I tell, I tell my fighters, like, listen, um, you know, fighting, swinging, swinging a punch is, it's, it's like a hose. Think about, think about a hose. If you, if you crank a hose, it's not going to flow. You have to relax. Mm -hmm. Every, every punch has to be relaxed. Everything in your body has to be relaxed. So it's just like when you make a mistake, when you make a mistake, you tighten up. If you relax, take a breath and you're ready for the next play, chances are you're going to, you're going to bring down the, the, the mistakes and you're, you're, you're going to help your team on to victory. That's one. So, you know, always remember. Great athletes, short memories. Um, mm -hmm. Then to get into some of the conversations, I don't usually get into it. I, tr I, tr I try not to get into stuff in that moment because, mm -hmm. you know, if there was something hard that happened on the field or whatever, um, and the kid is steaming or I'm steaming, I'm very competitive, so I could be steaming too. Um, but then later on, I always, you know, would talk to my kids. And it's interesting. We're having this conversation because we were, I, you know, like I said, we were just on the Christian Micro Tribe, and I was sharing this with those guys. Is that um, I would I have a conversation a lot of times with my kids about the culture of our home, and so I'll say like, you know, if Luke was playing a sport and there was a conversation or something that happened, I'd I'd say, hey, you know, you you know, this happened, and I I talk about that the example, and he'd be like, yeah, I said, you know, how how did that make you feel, and how did does that fit with the culture of our home? How, how should that conversation, you know, how, how could that conversation have gone better? Um, so really relaying things back to, you know, in talking to your kids and, and even when you get into sexual conversations with, with specifically your boys, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I have them with my boys, not I let my wife work with my daughter. But, you know, one of the things I got from my pastor many years ago is like, he'd be like, John, talk to your kids. Like, how does an Edwin man show up? right mm -hmm. so how does a labar man show up uh how does he treat 
uh, other people? How does he treat women? How, how should you treat your future wife? How do, how do you treat your wife? Right. So, you know, uh, I've talked to my kids about like, Hey, how do you see your dad treating your mom? How do you expect you should treat your future girlfriend or wife? Um, you know, and that, because we live in a society where it's just like, you know, everything's right in front of you. It's, it's so yeah. fast paced, but when you slow down, you think about the culture of your home and you remind your kids about the culture of your home, then they can, they'll carry that along with them. Yeah. I'm listening to a book right now called family unfriendly talking about how society itself is kind of set up to be unfriendly towards families, everything from like how we build communities um, to, you know, some of the the laws and, and things that have been coming into place about like, you can't even let your, you know, 11 year old kid walk to the park by himself anymore because, you know, you're going to be, you know, f- accused of, of child neglect and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I look at the the society as a whole anyways, like even if you look at uh, outside of those and the things that we push in front of our kids as a society, maybe not you or you or I, and hopefully not the listeners, but um, you know, when, when this is sitting in front of them uh, nine times out of the 10, you know, or their iPad is sitting in front of them, the things that are, they're exposed to, like it's super unfriendly to families, like how men are um, just completely pushed aside in society now. Um, like being a straight white male is about the worst thing you could possibly be in the world at the moment. Right. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of screwed. Um, but, uh, but like how, you know, how do I represent what, what it means to strive and be that good man in society, be that like, and, and, uh, um, you know, I think it was, uh, yeah, I want to say it was at church on, on Sunday because we're, as we're recording, this is two days past father's day, but, um, uh, uh, on Father's Day, they were talking about uh, there was a verse that they were reading about how um, I think it was at church that that the the world uh, um, when you follow you know what the Bible says the world is going to hate you right like there's just there's no way around it the world is going to hate you so how do I how do I raise my boys to be okay with uh, the world hating them knowing that the the world is not who you're trying to uh, to be like it's you know it's well beyond what we're what we're striving for and I'm I'm going off on like seven different tangents right now because my brain is going like it's there's there's so much to what you just said, plus what I'm listening to on this book, plus what I'm hearing at church. And it's like, man, oh man, like how important is it to really have like raise our kids in a way that is countercultural and um, that is uh, growth minded, that is, you know, respecting and honoring uh, women and each other um, and, you know, taking care of each other and being a good uh, leader. Uh, uh, especially for like for teaching my boys to be good leaders of 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 their families as they grow up, and it's like heartbreaking to me to kind of continue to to watch what's going on in the world and watch what's going on in, in families. And you know, like I think it's like forty one percent of kids uh, today are born to single parent families. Like, holy gracious! Like that's that's asinine to me. You know, like no wonder things are falling apart the way they are. Um, but uh, um, I love that you, you know, like the, the culture side of the house, like we talk about that in business all the time. What's the culture inside of your business? Like, is it encouraging? Is it encouraging mistakes? Or is it like, you know, are you whipping people for making mistakes? Like, what, what is the culture you're making? So inside your house, if you're not doing the same thing, um, you know, they're, they're going to get their culture from somewhere. So hopefully you're, you know, you know, the Edwin culture is the, the overpowering culture instead of, you know, the worldly culture. Yeah, I mean, and, and also... You have young kids, you know, I, we've, yeah. Christina and I have always been intentional about it, asking our kids to bring their friends to our home, um, mm-hmm. you know, just because, well, for a few reasons. One, we also want to influence their friends, but two, yeah. we want to know who they're hanging around with uh, because, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So, yeah. you know, there have been many instances where our kids' friends will come in and you know, they'll run up the steps and they'll be like, Mr. Edwin, I got, you know, honor roll or I did whatever. And it's like, it's pretty cool to see that happen because you know that you're being a great influence on not just your kids, but on, on mm-hmm. their friends. And, yeah. um, you know, so, so we want to create a culture where it's welcoming to other people to come through our home and, uh, and, and to sit down at dinner with us and, and hear the yays and nays and, and get, you know, good stuff that they may not be getting at, at home. So we've, you know, we've always been really intentional about, about that sort of thing. And, and look, there's been, um, you know, I can think right now of, uh, some friends, excuse me, of some friends that, um, my youngest son has that they don't like coming to my house because, because we have rules here, 
And uh, yeah. it's like, all right, well, too too bad, bro. Like this, this is the culture of my house. And and there there was one instance, uh, and I, I love this kid, uh, but but he was my older son's friend, and he did something. And I said, I said, bud, the, the door's right there, and if you're not going to abide by the by by the rules of this home, you're gonna you're gonna walk back back out that door right now. Yeah. And uh, and and I and I love the kid. He's he's a great kid. He's you know he's twenty, and he's he's like my own child. Nice. Yeah. And and to to encourage that level of of culture even outside of your own family like the, the culture is of the house like it's yeah it's it's in in nature of the family name don't get me wrong but um it, anybody who walks through this house is is abiding by said culture and you know like it, it that's just what we want to encourage in the house i love it um, yeah, and if you become friends with other dads of of these kids you know i'll i'll call the other dads and i'll have conversations with them and say yeah. hey you know, I heard this out of so and so, or both of our both of our kids were having this conversation because my my kids are far from perfect, right? I mean, there's, yeah. they make so many mistakes, um, and it's like, hey, I heard this conversation going on. I don't approve of it. I just want to make sure if you hear this at your house that you know we're we're aware of what our kids are are into or doing or whatever. Like there was a point in time where Luke and his buddies were uh, they they would love to go exploring abandoned buildings. Look, mm-hmm. that sounds pretty cool. If I'm, you know, 16, 17 years old, yeah. exploring abandoned, abandoned buildings, pretty awesome. But it's also very dangerous. And there was like one, um, one point where they went through a, uh, it was like an old, um, I think it was either an old prison or an old like psychi- psychiatric hospital. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, like, you do not think there's still cameras out there and police are not like driving past and you boys are like, on the cusp of 18 years old, you're going to get in trouble. Like, yeah. and we don't know who's in there by the way. So like, you know, I, I've called the other dads and I'm like, Hey, our, this is what our boys are doing. And this is what I found out. Just letting mm-hmm. you know, we, we want to keep tabs on them because we don't want them to get picked up by the law or, or worse getting, you know, getting themselves into some type of physical danger with somebody in there. I think that's just something in and of itself that you even had the parents' phone numbers, right? Because <laughs> too many, too many people they don't have a clue who the parents are of the kids who their our friends are hanging out, or their you know our kids as friends. Um, and that's something that I'm really wanting to curate myself is is knowing that I I know and like the parents of the kids too because that's where they're going to be getting a lot of their exposure. Um, so you know if 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 my kids are around kids of good solid parents, then that makes me feel a little bit better. I mean, it doesn't mean the kids aren't still going to be kids and do silly things, but um, but at least if I know the parents and I know like and trust the parents, that makes me a little bit more comfortable with the fact that my yeah. my kids are hanging out with them, especially as they get older. Yeah, I mean, look, my youngest, he's 15 and wanted to go to some party last night. Um, you know, his buddies were all going and I said, and Christine, I originally, he's like, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm like, yeah, 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 cool. And then when we kind of found out, we dug in a little bit. We're like, whoa, wait a minute. We don't know that kid. We don't know yeah. those parents. And the answer is no. And, and you know, we don't, t- we don't say no to our kids that often. But, um, you know, he was giving us pushback. I said, no, no, we don't know the parents and we don't know those kids. He's like, but you know these kids and you know I'm a good kid. I'm like, you are a good kid. Bad morals. <laughs> bad yeah. bad company corrupts good morals right yeah so um you know our kids don't hear know that often but uh but yeah we were just you know even at 15 and it's funny to say to a 15 year old no you can't do that but you just you just say no yeah i mean when your brain's not even uh your your ability to uh make wise decisions <laughs> like your frontal cortex isn't even developed until you're like 25 so right. it's our job to say no to a 15 year old boy like there's there's a lot of things that 15 year old boys need to need to be sold no to and i wish i wish i heard no a few more times than i did if i'm honest um but uh um but i do want to go like you you mentioned being part of cutco i know that um your son uh, your oldest son luke is uh uh, was a part of Cutco. I bought some Cutco from him. So, um, you know, like I, it kind of ran in the family. So what have been your conversations with your kids behind what you do as far as business behind to like entrepreneurship about behind, you know, building, obviously you talked about, they, they read, you know, seven years ago, they read rich dad, poor dad. So they've been on this path for a little while with you. Um, so what sort of intentional conversations have you had with them about your business and what sort of exposure do they have to what you do as, uh, um, as an entrepreneur? Tons. So we've never stopped since they were little. Um, our kids were, they would always be going with me to the gym, uh, you know, when, when they'd have a day off or if it was a Saturday and I'm going in, 
Uh, they would they would come to the gym with me. Cool thing is that you know dad owned an MMA gym, right? And there was fighters everywhere, mm-hmm. and you know that that that's kind of cool. It's not like they're going into an office cubicle, I guess. No knock on anybody who does that. It just wasn't what yeah. I, my path. And uh, there would also be like kids MMA, so other kids would be there, and you know they'd be they'd be learning you know ground ground control and and some striking and some different things. But uh, but yeah, I I always would bring my kids down to the gym with us. Uh, when Christine and I would be doing flips, uh, as little as they were, we'd put little hard hats on them. Uh, we'd take them through, like, you know, demo, demoed out houses, introduce some contractors, you know, show them what, what was happening, take them to the before, the middle, the after, so they could see all those different creations that we did uh, mm-hmm. in progress. Christine and I still to this day take our kids to closings when we're buying properties, when we're selling properties. Uh, we take them through walkthroughs. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to look at somebody's Let's say that somebody's selling a, a 15, uh, you know, a property portfolio. Um, you know, I'll try and take one of my kids or even one of my friend's kids. You know, we've taken our friend's kids to multiple of these things too, to open their eyes up too. And we'll walk through properties. I'm like, all right, what are you guys seeing? Like you tell me, you know, um, so we've, we've always been involved. My wife's a realtor. So she'll take our kids on like, you know, listing appointments and all that. She's like, if I get the listing, you get a hundred bucks at closing. So like the kids love to love to do that. And then more recently, uh, she's been sitting down with our, with our older two and going through like the P and L's of, of our different nice. properties that, that we, that we own. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so we're constantly having our kids involved in our businesses and, and listen, what, whether they end up going into real estate or doing the different types of businesses that, that we're in, at least they're equipped because one day they're, they're going to get left with it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, and just having the exposure in and of itself is enough to open their eyes to, to something and create again, that, that different level of a wireframe for them to look through, look through life with, you know, and, and to see it. Um, have you have they been like uh, at all employed by you, um, uh, if you will? Like, do they no, do some I work? No, I know that well? the, that's a thing that a lot of a lot of people do, uh, and there's some type of I think tax benefits to it. Uh, mm-hmm. But no, we we haven't we haven't done that. Um, you know, maybe in the future we'll do it, but no, we haven't yeah. done any quote unquote employment other than just little uh, incentives on hey, if yeah. you go with mom to this listing, and if she gets it, you know, you'll get x amount of dollars um we have had them actually invest in some syndications with us so okay. christine and i are investing in probably like 10 different syndications uh and we'll we'll write up a little contract and actually uh i think luke's been the only one but uh we were doing a flip and he had some money on the side and i'm like hey i mean we didn't need it but i'm like hey if you invest you know a certain amount you'll get a little percentage of, of what the, what the profit's going to be. And we'll write up a contract and he'll sign it and we'll sign it. Mm-hmm. But like with the syndication, it's like, all right, if you put a thousand bucks into this, we'll, we'll throw 500 on top and um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in. And as the, as the money comes in, you'll get, you'll get your dividends. And so, yeah, we've done stuff like that, which is kind of fun. Yeah, what a wonderful ability to expose kids to that sort of thing, right? I mean, yeah, I I try to think to myself what you know where where I would be if I had learned some of this stuff when I was a teenager, or if somebody had you know exposed me to some of this stuff as a teenager, where you know how different my life would have been. But at the same point, I'm pretty happy with with the way things turned out, you know, with uh, with the wife and kids that I have, and you know, it just uh, man, oh man, what I do, I wish that I would have learned a lot of this sooner, right? Um, what sort of questions have the kids been asking you? Like, do the kids kind of uh, go to you and say, "Hey, what what is this part of the business?" So, like, do any one of them like have a little bit more of a uh, a business mind and are asking a lot more questions than the others? And you know, how have you kind of encouraged that thought process? That's a great question. Um, I think I think all three of them are very interested, but they're also kind of into their own things right mm-hmm. now between school and other activities. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, Sylvie, she's, you know, like I said, she just graduated high school. She's waitressing, uh, at a, at a really cool little bar restaurant and Caleb's lifeguarding and, and Luke's actually, he might be taking an internship with, uh, with, with Dane, uh, in the, in the financial world where Dane is, uh, mm-hmm. managing family offices. So that would be a great exposure for him. But, um, as far as, like questions? No, usually I have some answers here, but uh, but but you know we go over things with them as we're doing different uh, projects, 
and uh and we're you know we're buying different properties or you know we've we recently done a 1031 exchange and we're right now in the middle of a 1031 exchange so we're exposing them to like hey here's a tax benefit that uh mm -hmm. you can also use in the future to continue to trade up in real estate uh just just like just like anything else and so you can you can elude these taxes if you just continue along this path on a 1031 yeah. and continue to grow your portfolio uh, but as far as specific questions, I can't, I can't think of any. Have there been any ways that like you had tried to expose them that failed miserably? Like they were just, that did not take to at all. I don't think so. I, I, I don't, I'm trying to think of it. Um, again, I guess, I guess with Luke, he, um, I, I connected him with my buddy, Mike DeHaan, who's in my champion pod. And, uh, and I thought it would be a great thing for Luke to get into wholesaling. And he's been doing uh, cold calls recently for Mike. And uh, he absolutely hates it. it I think it's been, a, <laughs> it's been a total failure. Uh, and uh, it's kind of funny. But, um, but it's good to at least try things. Because I'm like, hey, Luke, yeah. if you learn how to get off-market deals, like this could be a way for us to do business together. Like You find these deals. We'll fund them. We'll work out a partnership. But it just didn't. Okay. So that I would say that failed pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. But... I think that failed in a in a way that's a positive though as well, right? Because now he knows something he absolutely doesn't like. Because sometimes it's just as good. Often it's just as good to know what you hate uh, than to know what you like. As long that's as you know true. you're running towards what you like instead of running away from what you hate, because that's uh, those are two very different motivations. Um, yeah. What uh, uh, what sort of ways have you kind of um, brought the kids? Uh, I don't know. You you kind of already answered some of this stuff, but. Um, for me, like the the P and L conversations are something I really want to like as as uh, as part of like math because I, I homeschool now, so um, I want to as part of math class to even go over P and Ls and stuff like that. And you mentioned talking to your kids about P and Ls. Granted, your kids are a little bit older than mine, uh, but uh, what sort of ways have you been able to expose them to that that seem they seem to be more receptive on um, so versus uh, not? This is a fantastic question, and if if Christine was here with me, she could answer it so much better. Cause I'm kind of like the big vision and boots on the ground mm -hmm. and Christine is, is like the, the back end. And that's why we work really well together as business partners. A lot of husbands and wives uh, don't work together well as, as business yeah. partners and, and don't actually, they're not involved in each other's in, in the businesses, but her and I work very well together. So she balanced out all of our QuickBooks for every LLC and, and everything that we have every single month. So she's the one that actually, sits the kids down and, and goes through it. And uh, so she could answer that question, but it's, it's cool. Uh, and I actually think this past month she was, she was teaching them how to calculate caps. Uh, but she's, she's the one that, that kind of does that, does that part of, of our business. Teamwork. Absolutely love it. Absolutely right. love it. It's, it's one of I don't my get wife. In her way, man. I, I know better. Good. Yeah. I'm like, that is her yeah. lane and she's very good at it. And you know, um, she gets mad when I say this, that I, I, I sometimes call her the brakes because I'm moving too fast. And she's like, wait, you know, we have to, we have to get, we have to get all this stuff figured out before you can go over here and buy that piece. Like we gotta, yeah. like, this is, you gotta slow down. Um, and which is, which is very good for me because, you know, sometimes if you're running with no brakes, you're going to crash. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's one of those that, uh, the balance needs to be there, like between the two. And that's, uh, you know, my wife and I have a very, a very good relationship in that sense, but half the time she doesn't know what's going on on the business side because she just, she still got one more year left before she retires, uh, from the military, um, oh, so that, which I cannot wait for her to be done. Uh, but in one more year, she's like, well, I don't know what kind of involvement do I want to have? And I keep, you know, that's something that I'm pondering. Like, how do I make sure that they're, um, you know, that we do work well together, that, that things go smoothly when she does transition, or maybe does she actually want to do this or does she just feel like obligated because it's, you know, something that, that I'm running. So how is it that you two started to work together and, and how do you make sure that, that you do balance each other out without, um, you know, wanting to go, you know, to fisticuffs by the end of the day? You know, we started, so she, she really wanted to stay home. Um, when we, when we were having kids and, mm -hmm. uh, I guess she was kind of forced into it because I was working like 70 hours a week as a trainer. And then I was also buying properties and I was also managing the contractors. I couldn't do the financial part 
because yeah. it was only so many hours in a day. I mean, I was like super stretched. So she started out by take, she took a QuickBooks course early on, like many, like 20 years ago. And, uh, and then, and then she just, she just stayed with it. And as we grew, she was able to continue to grow and, um, and, and work through the books. Uh, as far as like arguments, we, thankfully we're, we're pretty, we know each other pretty well. Like we, we'll bicker, but we don't, we don't have too many arguments, thank God, or, around money. I, I hear that, you know, um, that's the number one thing, uh, is finances that, that couples argue about. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll argue. There's times where I, I want to keep, I remember this one time we had a terrible property management company, uh, in Scranton, which is where we buy most of our properties. And, uh, and like, we had like a 20% vacancy and I just kept like, putting more and more properties under agreement. And she's like, we can't put more and more properties under agreement until we stabilize this portfolio because we're losing money. Like we're hemorrhaging money right now. And, uh, and we were in the process of firing that property management company and hiring a new one. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but she was really wise in, in that. And, and so we literally sat on our hands for a few months and I hate to sit on my hands, but we, we had to take a sideline, um, you know, approach and and stabilize the portfolio and once it got you know fully fully rented again we we were up and running but um but really we're pretty in tune with one another you know if if she tells me like hey um we need to pay some attention over this side then then i'll i'll pay pay more attention to it and and, and uh and we'll we'll get it right so i think that there's uh, yeah, there is obviously that that common uh, statement that finances are like the number one reason for divorce and that type of thing. But um, I think it comes back to uh, communication um, and communication around whatever it is that, you know, oftentimes finances, right? If, if I'm seeing an issue with the money um, and then I, I don't communicate that well, then that can turn into much larger arguments. Uh, but what it sounds like to me is that a, um, uh, uh, both of you guys respect each other enough to, understand and hear the other person when they're speaking and say, okay, clearly there's something there I'm not seeing um, versus like feeling as a accusatory, like, no, you're stopping us from being successful by not letting me go get this other thing under contract. It's like, okay, let me take a step back and trust that my wife has our, our best interest in mind as well. Um, because you guys have practiced that communication over the years. And I'm, I'm completely assuming here. So that's why I want to throw it back to you and kind of get your no, thoughts that, on that. That's a hundred percent. Right. Um, you know, you got to communicate. You're absolutely right. I think that I think that big arguments could be small arguments if you communicate and communicate uh, when you when you're feeling that pressure or that stress. Yeah. Um, we do we do weekly meetings where her and I will sit down and go over all of our bank accounts, our businesses, what's up, what's down, um, and. That I think is a key to couples working together is making sure you take, I mean, like, you know, if you and I are in business together, Adam, we're going to sit down and we're going to have meetings, right? I mean, it's important mm -hmm. for us to know, you know, I need to know where you're going and what your goals are. You need to know where I'm going and where my goals are. And so, you know, uh, Christine and I are the same way, you know, we sit down and we go over our finances like, well, you know, I think we should go this direction. And she's like, and then there's that compromise also where, you know, we, we agree and sometimes we agree to disagree, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same, at the same point, even if you're agreeing to disagreeing, it's, it's the fact that you guys have both said your parts. You guys have had the com the communication about it. You guys understand where each other are coming to. You just know that you come to different conclusions and it's okay to come to different conclusions as long yeah. as you still are respecting the other party. It's, it's when there starts to be a little bit of, uh, um, so what I'm looking for, um, resentment in, in the, in the communication and resentment in the agreeing to disagreeing. Oh, I'm just agreeing to disagree because I just, I can't stand whatever. So like, no, 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 you're well on a, you're well on a path to you know having a divorce over finances when truly it was about your inability to communicate with each other um and that's to me it's i think that's the key important. that's the key is the resentment uh if there's yeah. resent resentment in a relationship that's that's cancer that will go grow rapidly and it, I, if there is that resentment um the, the the as a as a husband and wife you you really need to communicate and if you can't come to an agreement, you need to hire a professional to teach you certain tools and also to be an intermedi intermediary to help mm -hmm. out with, with that resentment because resentment will absolutely kill a relationship. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that goes, um, 
both uh, any relationship, not just husband wife. It's it's amplified husband wife because then you have kids involved and all the other stuff that goes along with it. Uh, but man, oh man, it can absolutely kill any relationship. Um, have you have you ever read the book or heard of the book Screw Tape Letters? Yeah, I, see yeah, I read Lewis. it. I read it when I was in college. Yeah, yeah. Warm so, I mean, I read it. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah, but it's one of those that's. Um, you know, I, I should go back and read it again because it's interesting. Like when you're reading it, I think if I remember hearing correctly, like C.S. Lewis talked about that being like one of the darkest places in his life when he had to go down all of those paths of how the devil actually, you know, comes in to, to play with your brain and, you know, make you think different things and all the stuff like how mentally draining it was. Um, but then you read it and you think to yourself, boy, these are, um, you know, while I while I, I hope that everybody that's listening um, is or eventually becomes a Christian, even if you're not a Christian, you can take a lot from that book as far as like how um, how your brain will play tricks on you um, to make you like have that resentment in one way, shape, or form, um, or you know, to not believe in yourself in one way, shape, or form because of you know whatever excuse or thought or uh, thing that we put in our way, whatever you know uh, item we put in our path. All that being said, how do you ensure as you're going day to day? Because you you always seem to be a super positive guy. You're always super driven. You're always you know kind of there. Like, what is it that you put in your life to make sure that you're guarding from uh, that level of, of of either self resentment or resentment of others, and you know like dwelling on and maybe you, maybe you do this and I don't and, and it's not something I get to see, but dwelling on some of the the hurt and pain in life as opposed to looking at the positive and growth in life. Yeah. Great question. I mean, it, it's it's not easy sometimes, you know. I think everyone has resentment about different things in their lives. Uh, you know, could be certain relationships that, that uh, haven't maybe worked out, different uh, family members maybe that you've had to cut off in your life. And, and what's been interesting is uh, since this whole COVID lockdown thing, um, you know, for unfortunately and fortunately, I have cut out a lot of toxic relationships, uh, mm-hmm. friendships that I've had, uh, people that have been in my life, family members. And um, it's just like anything else, you know, it's like you can't you can't eat pizza and cake and think you're going to get, you know, you're going to lose weight or get yourself in shape. Right. Um, you I don't know, appreciate you calling me out like that. I don't, I don't think I appreciate that. <laughs> You know, um, relationships are very much like a diet for your brain and who you're hanging out with, uh, will, will affect how you think. And, you know, I had to come to a place, uh, over the last couple of years where I'm like, is this friendship or is this relationship a one way street or a two way street? And if I answered, it was a one way street and I was the one keeping the, the relationship alive and I was the positive one. And, you know, listen, life, like any relationship is a give and take, you know, there, there, there's times where you're, you know, I'm taking in my, in my marriage and there's times where I'm giving, but, um, and Mm -hmm. friendships, but if it's always like you giving, then that relationship is toxic. And, and like I said, like any other diet, you, you have to eliminate these types of things and free up that brain space to allow yourself to be creative and also be grateful in your life. Right. Um. I think gratitude is a, is a huge thing. Um, almost every morning, one of the rhythms that uh, Christine and I have put in, into our life over the last probably probably started about six years ago is uh, we do a gratitude journal in the morning where we just write down three to five things that we're grateful for and then three to five things that will make today great. And then I write down just like a little, you know, a little affirmation on the day. And that kind of sets my tone. I also do Wim Hof breath work in the morning. Uh, I find that that gives me a lot of clarity. I was doing cold showers for a while. I just, one day I just literally stopped, but I was doing them every day for months and months. And one day I was like, I don't want to get in a cold shower today. And I didn't stop doing it. But <laughs> but, the, but the breath work, uh, I've been doing breath work for uh, almost four straight years, probably four straight years, uh, almost every single day. And then, and then the gratitude journal is about six, seven years. Um, and I've found that those types of things tend to set your mindset on the day. And, and you know, people say, if you win the morning, you win the day. Mm, love it. Uh, you, you said there were um, on the gratitude journal, I just want to make sure I get my note correct, but the uh, five things that you're grateful for, three to five things you were grateful for, and then three to five things, something else I, I missed. That the will make thing. today great. That will make today great. That's right. Yeah. Like I'll think about my day in the morning. Um, and, and Christine and I, we... Almost every morning, some some morning she's out of bed before me, and vice versa. But we try and um, 
before we do anything, we try and pray together in the morning. So we'll spend mm-hmm. maybe five, literally five minutes in prayer in the morning. Nothing crazy. Um, you know, we'll both be kind of tired, but she'll like put her head on my shoulder and we'll pray together for five minutes. Um, and then, and then we'll, I'll start the breath work and then I'll come down and I'll do my gratitude journal. And then we share our journal. And a lot of times the kids on the weekends, especially will do uh, gratitude journals for the kids, but they, they wouldn't it. do them like every day. They, they, they haven't been as consistent, but they still, they'll do, they'll do them. Sometimes I think they do them just to appease us, but, um, yeah, that's but okay. Still, that's okay. It's okay. It's <laughs> that's right. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah I, I, my, it's funny. My wife and I, I was just talking to her, I think yesterday, day before something like that, how I would like us to start doing like a gratitude journal together, uh, to be able to encourage each other and start our day off in a, in a, a better, more positive light. Um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, we, she gets up and gets ready for work early and then maybe I'm on my way to the gym and we don't actually get to spend much time in the morning. So it's not until the evening after our days have already exhausted us that we truly get to, you know, talk to each other. And by that point, like, we've both taken enough licks that it's like, well, now we're not in the best headspace to be able to communicate well with each other and have that positivity with each other the way we should. Um, so I love that you start that off in the morning with your wife. You know, I talk to a lot of people that it's just, they, they go and they have their own quiet time. They sit down and they, you know, they do their own journal and they drink their coffee. Uh, but to me, like the family is such an important thing that I love that you include your wife in that, um, in that morning routine for you. And I, I think that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Thank but, you. Thank you. It, it, uh, it has been, it has been magical. It's been, It's just, it's a shift in your mindset because if you just get up and you don't have time and you start like just running, boom, it's like, oh, I got to get here. I got to get there. You, it's, it does something weird where that anxiety isn't, isn't good for our brain. It's not good for our spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, so like it, whenever I have to wake up, I try and backtrack it by an hour and a half to two hours usually two hours I try and backtrack uh, just so I can get in the right mental space to, uh, yeah. to, to, to crush the day. Nice. Absolutely love it. Hey, as we're getting ready to, uh, to wrap this up, I want to kind of hand it over. Is there anything that, uh, that you really wanted to hit that we haven't quite covered yet? Is there anything that kind of popped up that you have questions for on my side, anything like that? Good question. Um, you know, what's your intention? What, what was your intention on starting this podcast? Uh, honestly, that that's something that that has been asked a couple times, and I I my biggest intention was to uh, um, well, I'll give you a, a small background. I'll try not to make it too awfully long. But I spent eighteen years in the military, saw a lot of divorces, saw a lot of dads who never saw their kids that I didn't know they were dads. Like they just like all of a sudden one day I was like, wait, you have a fourteen year old kid? How did I know that? We've been friends for eight years. How did I not know you have a fourteen year old kid? Right. But they just never saw their dads. And I've wanted to be a dad since I was like thirteen. So like literally since I remember being a young teenager and going, man, I can't wait to be a dad. I just I if for something something about it, I just wanted to be a dad. Um so then when I became a dad and I was still in the military bouncing around all over the world, I was like, I gotta change I gotta change something because I'm I'm missing out on a lot of of time with my kids. And then come into the entrepreneur side of the house and i see a lot of entrepreneurs doing the same thing of like hey i'm doing this for my kids working 17 hours a day and it's like okay when was the last time you sat down at dinner with your kids when was the last time you saw your kids like and they just they can't answer that question but yet they're quote unquote building this business for their kids mm-hmm. um so it was like hey i want to talk to other dads who are doing this right or even doing it wrong that i can learn from uh that i can steal all of their good ideas and if by chance somebody who hears this on the other side gets something from it as well great otherwise at least i had a good conversation with a solid uh with a solid dad and i learned something from it um so that's kind of my intent i haven't uh i haven't done anything to try to really grow it or anything other than just kind of keep chatting with dads and uh, see where it goes but that's that's been kind of where it came from and why i'm why i'm doing it yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I had a similar mindset behind jumping in uh, and running the Capital Hacking podcast. I literally did it so I could like meet other people and have great conversations and understand yeah. them and their mindset and know what they're investing in and know a little bit about more about them. Um, and we don't monetize it yet either. It's just kind of a fun project where we can have awesome people on there. And the yeah. cool here's another cool thing about running a podcast that I found. When there's like a keynote speaker somewhere that, you know, costs maybe thirty, forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars, and you walk up to them afterwards, you're like, Hey, I really loved X, Y, and Z. By the way, I run a podcast, would you be on? You can have mm-hmm. that person on at no charge and get so much yeah. value from them. Yeah. It's yeah. it's literally amazing. And you can build a relationship. Um but one of the things you said is uh w- what would you 
what question didn't I ask or what what would you want to kind of uh, talk to the listeners about? And that's, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about being great dads, but if you want to be a great dad, be a great husband. Very much so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, uh, you know, I cannot, and I, I've said it multiple times on this podcast, and I'll, I'll say it every, uh, if I could, I'd say it every podcast. But, um, you know, my, my priorities are my God, my wife, and then my kids, right? So yep. by, yep. by being a great husband, I will then become a better dad um, because yeah. you know I, I am representing a, a lot more than just um, you know playing with the kids or 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 you know providing for them or bringing them out to eat or whatever. Like there's a lot more involved in that by being a solid good husband um, that I fail at miserably every day, but I'm doing what I can to uh, uh, to hopefully be a, a good husband for my wife. Um, but no, I, I appreciate you uh, hammering that home because it's it is uh, an absolute truism that you know be a a solid husband um and know what that means and to me you know I, I, without having my god first that makes it very difficult um to, sure. uh, to even show up for my spouse so um but uh john i really really appreciated you coming on thank you so much for your time uh your wisdom and, and passing a bunch of knowledge on um uh thank you so very much again but uh, if people want to get a hold of you or listen to your podcast or uh in any any way shape or form kind of reach out what's the best way for them to do that Sure. You can find me on Instagram. You can type in John Edwin. Um, it's I'm right now at strength personal training. That's probably going to change because I, I sort of retired from that four years ago. I'm like, my wife, tell my wife, I, I, sh- I should probably change. She's like, yeah, you should change that. But uh, yeah, she's but, a marketing yeah. person. Like you, she, I'm sure she's encouraging you to change. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you can find me on, at John Edwin on um, Instagram or Facebook. Um, you know, I'm not on here really to promote anything yet. When we write the book, uh, on, on marriage and family that Christine and I do, we'll, we'll be back on and promote that, um, oh, that'd be that's awesome. a bucket list item, but yeah. And if you want to check out another great podcast, capital hacking podcast is, is absolutely awesome. It's on alternative investing, investing a lot of good abundance guys are on there. Uh, myself and Josh McCallan co-host that. And, uh, and if you want to be on there, we'd love to have you on. So, um, awesome. yeah, just, just happy to, uh, to be on here and hopefully I made an impact to your listeners. Uh, well, um, I know you made an impact to me and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for jumping on, John. Um, I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day. Everybody listening, please like, subscribe, uh, go follow uh, John and his podcast, Capital Hacking Podcast. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody on the next one and uh, have a good one.